Well, good morning, and welcome to Polk Run Church. If you're visiting, we welcome you. If you're visiting by Facebook or YouTube, we welcome you as well. So we appreciate all of you being here. Uh, just a couple announcements from the bulletin on the very inside first page. Um, deacons would like to thank everyone who attended and helped with the Palm Sunday dinner. It was good to be back in table fellowship. But they sadly announced that the 2022 Strawberry Festival is officially canceled. On the, I didn't think the mic was on. I was yelling. <laughs> Got me. Okay. The, on the positive side, the last soup for the soul of the season is Wednesday, May 11th, and the soup will be Italian wedding soup. They are also looking for volunteers to make cookies, approximately three cookies per bag. Um, so if you can help with that, please do so. And now if you turn to the very back page of the bulletin, our announcements for this week, uh, we suggest for the time being that you call the office before you come out. This evening at 7 o'clock we have an ongoing Bible study. It's here, we meet here in the church and we also have a presence by Zoom. Tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, the trustees and anyone who would like to help them will be working in the cemetery. On Tuesday at 10 in the morning, we have a ladies' Bible study here, to which all are welcome. 7 o'clock Tuesday evening, we have, so far we're calling it Kids Club, it's uh, online, and then Session also meets this Tuesday at 7, and again Wednesday, Soup for the Soul. Today is Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. We have, over the years, recognized those persons in our church or associated with our church who are graduating. First of all, would like to say to you that Jeffrey Wilkinson, who's son of Dave and Amy, who are right here, uh, will graduate from Washington and Jefferson College on May 21st. He has majors in mathematics and economics and a minor in finance and he'll be going to Michigan State as a grad student to work towards a PhD in economics, so congratulations to Jeffrey. And we do have a book for him, Amy. Do you want to take it now, or? And then others um, associated with us, um, Joshua Obringer, Elizabeth Rose Fisher, Ethan Woodall, and Ethan Blair will also be graduating in different venues. So now I would ask that you turn to the call to worship. This is printed in the bulletin. It's on the second inside page. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. O oh, come, let us bow down and worship. For the Lord is our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death. 
and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection may, through the renewing power of your spirit, arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now, if you are able, I would ask that you stand and we will sing together hymn number 316. This is in the blue hymnals in the pew in front of you, 316. God's amazing love is just this, that while we were still far from God, while we still had no intention of coming to God, while we were out on our own merry ways in the world, God came to us. Christ came for us. Christ died for us. So now, because we have faith in him, we can approach God with confidence because this is a God who seeks out you and I. This is a God who reaches into the hidden cracks and crevices of our life, even as we will see today when we are hiding away. God suddenly shows up. So know that you can come to God in faith and be open and honest before him. Let us do this in silence. And now if you would turn in your bulletin to the prayer of confession, we will confess our sin together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. 
And so now hear good news. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save you and I. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin, but alive to all that is good. I declare to you then, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. And let us pray. Now, holy God, that we see that you have come to us, we come to you. We come to you with hearts and minds and will open to hear your word. Speak it again and again and again to us until it so fills us that we are yours in Christ in whom we pray. Amen. We have two readings today, one from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the other from the Gospel of John. Our lector today is Valerie Hansen, so please listen as we read. Good morning. Motherhood, my most challenging job and my most rewarding. Thanks be to the Lord. <laughs> A reading from the Old Testament, book Genesis, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. Listen for the word of God. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
lest I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, and although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here end the readings. Thanks be to God. C.S. Lewis said that for every new book a person reads, a person should read an old book. And so over the week I took a look at an old book written in 2010. Uh, that's old these days. <laughs> okay. That's not what C.S. Lewis was thinking, but... Uh, uh, this was long before Bitcoin and AI and market crashes and housing bubbles and all the things that we worry about. Uh, it's written by Gabe Lyons, um, who's still active. I think he was only 27 when he wrote this. Um, the book is called The Next Christians. Okay. What, Gabe Lyons is very aware that in 2010, Christianity or at least church as we know it, was changing dramatically, right, right before his eyes. He was very aware that every year there are fewer persons in church on Sunday. He was very aware that uh, there were growing numbers of people who, when asked what their religion affiliation was or religious affiliation was, said none. He, he's aware of all this, and yet he has a very positive outlook on the church. And that makes him different from most of the other literature that's out there then and out there now. His vision is extremely optimistic because he says we are being called to be new kinds of Christians for the old original purpose of restoring the world to God. And I, I rather like that. Uh, he claims it's more than about feeding the world or providing charity for the world. It's more than getting people to believe something, but it's about, again, restoring the world. Um, here's a quote from his book. He says, Christians are called to partner in a restorative work so that the torch of hope is carried until Christ returns. This is a story of God, the whole story. And then he goes on to say, we began with the perfect creation, when God breathes life into humanity, and we end in a perfect world, the new Jerusalem. And in between, we're given this challenge of not only living in this world, but living within the world and restoring it. And he claims that this is a vision Jesus gave to the disciples. So I want to look at our reading from John today and as much as we can stay simply within the context of that reading. What did the disciples know? For instance, they did not yet know about Paul's letters. That's all added later. They did not know about Calvinism or Arminianism or any of the other 10,000 isms that are out there in our world today. They only knew what they had seen 
and what they had experienced in the Old Testament. That's all they had. So, here are 11 men and perhaps a number of women and others. Uh, John's not that definite. And they have a problem. And the problem is the man in whom they had placed all their hopes, the man whom they had followed, the man who had their dreams, was dead. Yes, there's a lot of stories flitting about out there that the grave is empty and maybe some women had seen Jesus and perhaps Peter. But as far as these guys are concerned, Jesus is dead and now what? When Jesus died, his vision died with them. And if the authorities who crucified Jesus find these men, they'll be dead pretty soon as well. That's how they handled insurrection. And I think often this is part of the problem that plagues our society as well. Often within the church, for all practical purposes, Jesus is dead. In fact, that's what the Jesus Seminar tells us. His ideas live on, maybe, sort of, kind of, but Jesus is dead. And even those who believe in scripture, accept the creeds and the five fundamentals, live day to day as if Jesus is dead. And he makes no part in their fundamental decisions, like what job do I get, what house do I live in, what kind of car do I drive, And so on. What do I do Sunday morning? Or Sunday evening? Or Wednesday evening? As far as impacting our day-to-day decisions, I just talked to a friend of mine. He sold all his Bitcoin. He's holding Ethereum. I can guarantee you Jesus was not part of that decision. Okay. See, we live as if Jesus has no bearing on our everyday life. Our faith, if we have faith at all, is locked away in our hearts. And so in a very strong sense, we are like the disciples. We are huddled behind closed doors, wondering what we should do with this. We live, for the most part, as if Jesus were dead. But now, now the, now the disciples have a greater problem because Jesus is standing right there. He's alive, he's real, he's touchable. Later on, at least, he eats. You know, apparently, we can't lock him out anyway. John doesn't tell us how he got there. He does not say he came through the walls. He does not say he dropped out of the sky. He doesn't even say he came through the locked doors. It just says he came and he stood among them. Maybe they left the door open, although I doubt it. This was no easier for the disciples to believe than for us. It was no easier for them to believe that Jesus had died and risen than it is for us. In fact, it might have been harder because they lived closer to death. They saw death almost on a daily basis, whether through the persecution of the Romans, whether it be through uh, just, just the conditions of life and death in those times were horrific. Average age of death for women was 16 to 18, men 22. And they knew very well that people did not rise from the dead. And maybe by 
our standards, they were superstitious and believed in ghosts and demons and goblins and powers and principalities. But then again, people tell me all the time they've seen ghosts. So maybe not. However that may have been, they did not believe a man on his own or by any power they knew of could rise from the dead. and be a touchable, living person. Which is why I think Thomas was so adamant. He wanted to see, he wanted to touch, he wanted to handle. And actually the verbs there are pretty powerful. It's not touch, it's unless I thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Yeah, here Jesus stands, and that's a great problem for the disciples and for the world today. But it gets worse. Okay, Jesus died. He stands here. And now he speaks. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And think what the disciples would pick up from that. As God sent Jesus into the world, they are being sent into the world, the very world that crucified this man. And that's not exactly what they want to hear. (laughs) He says, unlock the doors, guys, and walk out into this bright, sunshiny world full of Romans and Jews and Pharisees and Sadducees. Because I want you to transform it. I want you to make it new. I want it returned to the Garden of Eden, or at least prepared for the new Jerusalem that's coming. And I can't do that. You can't do that. We can't do that. The disciples couldn't do that until Jesus breathed the Spirit on them. This is a transformative power that comes by grace. When by grace we receive the Holy Spirit and are transformed into new persons with an old message. This is just like God bringing a clump of dirt to life. God made Adam from a clump of clay or an earthling from the earth. And it's just a, I don't know, a clay doll. Just like we're a pile of chemicals. So God breathes life into it. Then it's something new, something different, something unique. Something with great power, power to live for God, power to rebel against God. So we have a problem when Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. And it's It's very easy to make him into an ancient wonder worker or an ancient philosopher or a good man who is a model. But we have a greater problem when Jesus shows up in our lives and calls us to something new. Making seemingly impossible demands on us. that we go out into the world and tell this story. And I suppose we should ask at least briefly why. Because this is a story that frees us. And here, yes, I'm dabbling in Paul's letters a little bit, but it's a message that frees us First of all, from the fear of death. If we know that in our faith we are promised by the God who has never broken a promise that we have eternal life, that is very freeing and very powerful. 
And at the same time, Christ's death frees us from the power of sin. That is, it frees us to be the human beings God intends us to be so that we can do God's will and continue this where we started, I suppose, this restoration process to be those called, to be those elect, to be a blessing to the world, to bring Christ to the world, to bring freedom to the world. It's a call into God's kingdom. It's a call to freedom. It's a call to be who God wanted us to be so that we can take the message to others so that others can hear this and be free to the fear of death. Other than public speaking, it's the number one fear in America. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's connected, but it's just a fact. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I have people from time to time ask me, how I can believe this. And my answer that I want to give them, well, I just do. <laughs> and, and I know that's not a sufficient answer. But I believe it because it's true. And that's not an answer either. To tell people outside the church that I believe because God gave me the grace to believe, which is why I believe I believe, doesn't seem to get traction. But what I do know is I have seen faith change people's lives. I've seen it change mine and I've seen it change other people's lives. I know that people who come to faith live differently. I know that they stand out in the world. I know that they make changes in other people's lives because I have seen it. And this, I think, is a good starting point when we're talking to people. to move away from the theological abstractions. And if you'd like a couple hours on BART, settle back. <laughs> Say. After which, you'll probably be no different than before, except maybe better rested if you fall asleep. <laughs> what, what, what I'm driving at is finding ways to tell other people who don't know how faith has changed you and how you have seen it work in your life. Okay. This is not as easy as it seems. Because I think a lot of times we tend to blame things on God that are not God or even attribute things to God that are not God. But it's that subtle underlying change. I wish I could give you a measure, but it, it's, it's a measure of seeing the world with different eyes, of seeing people in need, of seeing, of living with humility and a kind of integrity. But it has to be yours. It can't be mine or Bart's or Calvin's or whomever you make your heroes. God changes us. When we believe this simple story that Christ died on the cross for our sins 
and God raised him on the third day, according to scriptures, first of all, to believe it is a gift of grace. And then it changes us. So I would suggest you look carefully at your own life to say, where have I changed? When would I have lied my way out of this and today I'll face it and tell the truth? Not because I read it in a self-help book, but because I believe now that this is what God calls me to do. When would I have fallen to a particular temptation, and we all have them, and now I don't even see it as a temptation. These will be unique to each of you. But then you can go and tell. I was like this, and now I'm not. In the old language, I was lost, but now I'm saved. I didn't believe, now I believe. It can be that simple. Why do I believe? I just do. Let's pray. Holy God, after we sort through all the reasons that we might believe, after we trace back to the beginning and say, well, there must have been a creator, after we do all these things, come to us and change our hearts so that we simply believe. Amen. Again, if you are able and comfortable, please stand and we will sing together hymn number 379 in our blue hymnals, 379. Please be seated. And now let us pray.
Gracious God, we come to you week by week to worship, to sing our songs, to give you praise as we are able, to pray for your blessing, to pray for our needs, and as we can, to bring you our blessing. Oh Lord, we are your people. We are called here for this worship. We are called here to be present to you and then to understand that you are present to us, that you stand before us just as Christ stood before the disciples, that you call us just as you called to the disciples, that you send us into this world to be a blessing to proclaim your message that frees people from the power of sin and death and to live lives of hope and joy and peace. Strengthen us, O Lord, in our faith. Give us that knowing that comes with grace, that knowing that you have touched us, that we have begun a journey that we would not have begun on our own that like Thomas, we have touched and handled and seen and heard your word and heard your call and responded and said, my Lord and my God, so that now you are the one who still leads us forward. As we follow, keep us faithful, keep us safe, and keep us strong. We pray this for all your people in all the world, in the tiny house churches, in the great cathedrals, in tiny struggling denominations, and in the great structures of Christianity. Let us all come to this one fact that you are Lord and you are God, and we are called to do your work in your way. And then send us out with our own witnesses. I believe. And if you believe, you can live your life with joy. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.